Good evening and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Going to be sending you a double shot of bulletins today plus a live stream to catch up. Given the fact that I haven't released any content in a few days, had a number of things to take care of here, mostly in regards to the preparation that I'm going to need to go through in order to move to the United Kingdom in September. Have to clear out all of my possessions, liquidate pretty much everything that I've got. I'm not taking a whole lot with me across the Atlantic. It's going to be an involved process over the next few months, but going to be able to get through it and looking forward to this new stage in my career and in my personal life. And by the way, it seems that my son will be accompanying me to the UK as he has been accepted at the University of Birmingham uh, City. I think it's what it's called, the University of Birmingham City, trying to get all of that clear. He knows more about it than I do, but very, very excited about what's coming for him. All right. All of that having been said, big stuff happening, obviously, in the world of space flight as well. And the thing that I am the most angry about, the most irritated about, is the whole situation that continues to develop around the failure of the new H3 rocket. <laughs> As I stated in a previous video, there was no real, real reason to get bent out of shape over everything that happened in regards to this failure. Yeah, it was disappointing. And yeah, a very valuable payload was lost. It was definitely a setback, but not a setback that should go completely or should be completely unexpected. This was a brand new rocket utilizing a lot of new technologies, a lot of new parts. I mean, this sort of thing. Thing often happens on the first launch of a very costly rocket. However, that's not how things have been going. And I must admit, I was wrong. The implications for JAXA, the implications for Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, for the H3, for the entire Japanese space program are actually very severe. And for reasons that I think are completely unjustified. Because when it comes right down to it, Japan is holding this rocket and JAXA and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries to unrealistic expectations. Perfection is being expected and indeed demanded right out of the gate. Now, I agree that perhaps JAXA should not have placed such a valuable cargo on board a brand new rocket on its maiden flight. That does make sense, but there were some good reasons as to why this should have been done so quickly. But on top of that, we also need to put this into some kind of context here, because when it comes right down to it, there was a period of time when SpaceX was experiencing a high number of failures as well and losing some valuable cargoes, and yet they weren't being held to the same exacting standards. Three, two, one. Ignition sequence start and liftoff of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket adding to the International Space Station access for future American rockets. Given the unmatched success ratio of Falcon 9 these days, it's kind of hard to remember the days when things weren't so rosy for this new rocket. Yeah, things looked very promising at first, but still, as far as reusing the booster was concerned, it was more often that it failed than it succeeded. As a matter of fact, the best they could hope for back in 2015 and 2016, for the most part, was controlled landings in the ocean, which of course did not reuse the booster. Every now and then they would try to hit a landing pad, but most of the time it wouldn't work. But in addition to that, in the 16 launches that took place in 2015 and 2016, two of them failed, which makes for a success ratio of just over 87%. And the cargoes that were lost were not insignificant either. This particular launch in 2015 was carrying a resupply mission to the 
ISS. Not only supplies, of course, but also important scientific experiments to be carried out on the space station as well. Not an insignificant loss. And then, on top of that, to make things worse, an explosion of an Antares rocket had taken out a resupply mission in the previous year. This was a bit of a bumpy time for the space station and for SpaceX, but they didn't let that stop them. Yes, it did take another six months until the 22nd of December of 2015 before SpaceX tried again and succeeded, by the way, but they pressed on. And guess what? About eight and a half months later, on September 3rd, 2016, during a static fire test, SpaceX lost another cargo. The Amos 6 communications satellite being launched for Israel. And by the way, this payload was worth almost $200 million. Oh, and also, they need not have lost the payload at all. There is no reason why SpaceX needed to have the payload installed on the rocket during a static fire test. It could have been done afterwards. Immediately thereafter, SpaceX implemented a policy change on these matters, and of course they did take a little flack for these incidents, but still not nearly as much flack as JAXA is currently taking for their decision to load this payload on the H3. So what is really going on here? Why is this happening? Well, one of the main reasons, in my opinion, is that Japan and the Japanese culturally tend to be extremely hard on themselves in the event of a serious failure. And this is regarded as a serious failure, at least as far as experts in Japan are concerned. Quote, Until recently, Japan was at the edge of a cliff, but it was still hanging on. Now it has fallen from the top league, said Akira Sawaoka, a space expert and president emeritus of Daido University. But this statement pales in comparison to an article that was recently released by Kyoto News, quote, Japan's failure to launch its new flagship H-3 rocket at the second attempt on Tuesday casts a long shadow over its strategy to increase its presence in the increasingly competitive fields of satellite launching and space exploration. Considerable time may be needed to get to the bottom of the disastrous outcome in which the rocket's second stage engine failed to ignite. At a panel meeting at the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, on Wednesday, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency reported that the second stage engine likely did not ignite due to an abnormality in the power system, but that it is investigating the precise cause of the failure of the country's first H-3 rocket. The failure was a shock to the agency, as it had assumed that the biggest challenge for the H-3 rocket would be the main first stage engine. Concerns over this led to a two-year delay in the launch. The article goes on to explain that it was this two-year delay that compelled JAXA to put this very expensive mapping satellite on the H-3 rocket in the first place, that the delay had been so significant that JAXA wanted to satisfy the customer's timetable, and launching this satellite on the maiden flight of the H-3 was the only way to accommodate this. And given the fact that the H-2, the predecessor to the H-3, had a 97.5% success ratio with only one failure in its entire history, this seemed to be a good idea. And by the way, I still maintain that it wasn't a bad idea because as you can see from the first 20 launches of Falcon 9, having a few successful launches under your belt does not really guarantee success. The two most significant failures of Falcon 9 took place after the rocket had several successful launches, and it seemed to be a pretty solid rocket, even though the booster wasn't successfully landing much at the time. However, as you can see from the Japanese press and the statements of other Japanese experts recently, they have been positively merciless. Quote, unlike the previous cancellation and postponement, this time it was a complete failure, said Hirotaka Watanabe, a professor at Osaka University. This will have a serious impact on Japan's future space policy, space business, and technological competitiveness. Why? 
Why is it this serious? Yes, it's a significant failure. Yes, they lost a valuable payload, but so did SpaceX more than once. And yet at the same time, customers and NASA recognized that given the history of incredibly expensive costs per kilogram to get anything into space, the promise that SpaceX offered the space industry was so great that a couple of disasters were to be expected during the process and were worth absorbing given all the benefit that SpaceX was bringing to the industry in general. And this is definitely the case with the H3 as well, because even though it's not reusable, even though it doesn't include quite as much innovative technology as the Falcon 9 did, it is very inexpensive, about $38 million per launch, significantly cheaper than the Falcon 9, which for the first time Time will give Japan a competitive pricing edge over SpaceX and a lot of their other competitors. This makes H3 definitely worth it, and a single failure need not sabotage the entire program. However, it has been observed and it is generally agreed that H3 will almost definitely not launch again this year, which is absurd given the fact that SpaceX picked themselves up, dusted themselves themselves off and launched again in six months in both circumstances with both anomalies regardless of what the cost was of failure and this is what Japan needs to be doing as well but they most definitely are not and that is something that is putting the entire program in jeopardy and this impacts not only Japan it also impacts Artemis because as I have stated in previous videos that are going to be linked at the end of this one, by the way, Japan can play a very important role in the success of Artemis and the general cost effectiveness of the program and our ability to maintain human beings on the lunar surface this time to stay. Losing JAXA completely would be a huge blow to the program in general. A second H3 has already been built. At this point, Japan should work towards the objective of getting that second second rocket fully tested and off the ground in less than six months, the same way that SpaceX did. Pressing forward, regardless of problems, regardless of setbacks, is the key to success in this industry. And the only way that you're going to get a very consistent and very high level of success is to keep practicing, which means you need a high launch cadence. You don't need two, three, four launches a year. You need a dozen or 24 launches a year in order to establish a high success percentage and you're not going to do that by being this timid and this hard on your space program. Smash that like, hit that subscribe. We are now about 2,900 subscribers away from that 100K. So many of you have joined lately. Thank you so much for doing that. And also, please check the description for various ways to support my content in the future. And as always, stay angry about space.